Welcome to the Invested Dads Podcast, simplifying financial topics so that you can take action and make your financial situation better, helping you to understand the current world of financial planning and investments. Here are your hosts, Josh Robb and Austin Wilson. Hey, Josh. Are you excited to record another episode for these amazing listeners we have? I'm, I'm ready to go. I mean, I tell you what, we've been we've been getting it done, and people yeah. are uh, receiving them well. So we're excited to push some more uh, content out today. How about that? I I got my notes, got my dad joke, got everything ready to go. Got my drink. You're drinking that iced uh, tea poisoned. with mango. You're poisoned. So Josh is trying to poison me. Uh, for anyone who cares, I am allergic to mango. All right. Hey, hey, hey. Welcome back to the Invested Dads Podcast. Thanks for being here today. We are excited to bring you a special episode where we are going to discuss a fairly particularly popular... Wow, that is a mouthful. Particularly popular. PP. It's a particularly popular investment topic. That being Svad. Svad. That's the uh, Russian version of grass you roll out on your yard when you're trying to fill in an empty place. Yeah, how about not, Josh? That would be called Sod. Svad. Svad stands for streaming video on demand, but because that's a mouthful, and I wish I had the ability to have that the Russian accent. I'm I'm not Russian. I wish Russian fans, you guys teach me sometime. Um, we're gonna call this episode "Streaming Wars." So stream wars. That's like um, when I compare the Mississippi to like the Nile River or the Amazon, right? See who's who's better. Josh, you're over two. But if that was the case, I would take the Nile and win. But we're going to say streaming wars, not stream wars. We're not fighting with streams. So this is a war because the population only has so many waking and so many watching hours to give these services. And they're really fighting for eyeballs. And yes, I realized that that sounds gross after it came out of my mouth. Yep. And fighting for eyeballs because there's commercials, there's ad revenue, and then there's a reoccurring subscription fee. So the more people that subscribe and tune in, the more viewers you get, the more money you get. Exactly. And we will have more on the business case here in a little bit. So I guess the the major players are, number one, obviously, Netflix. I don't think anyone would dispute that they're the undisputed streaming king. It is amazing to see that this company has come from a mail-to-your-house DVD rental company all the way to where it is today with 61 million U.S. subscribers as of the third quarter 2019 and 158 million global subscribers around that same time. Those numbers were provided by Statista, and the link is in the show notes. And, you know, thinking back to that DVD rental, I don't know if you did it. I, I remember that. You'd mail them in, get two, send one back when you're done. And get we had one. it. You have your little queue list of things when you exactly. send it back for it. But I also remember reading about how they went and met with Blockbuster back when Blockbuster was huge about maybe buying, being bought out and becoming part of Blockbuster. And uh, Look how, look how out. that turned out. Yeah. <laughs> Blockbuster is gone and Netflix is enormous. Next up is Amazon Prime Video included. With an Amazon Prime membership or available separately, I think it's like $9 a month, and they've put some original content out there. I think it's like Jack Ryan's, one of their big ones, the yep. Marvelous Mrs. Maisel's one of them. And this seems it's good content. It's well put together, and they've also got a host of other TV shows and movies and things on there that you can watch through there. The The next up is one of them that's relatively new to the game as of the end of 2019, that being Disney+. Plus. So Disney Plus launched with a relatively full vault of Disney movies, Marvel movies, Star Wars movies, Pixar movies, classic Disney movies, including Aladdin, which is my favorite Disney movie, TV shows, Disney Channel TV shows, Disney Channel original movies from the 90s when we were kids and it was awesome, National Geographic, because when they acquired some of those assets from the 21st Century Fox acquisition, they got to do use those two. And there's new originals, like Star Wars Mandalorian, which I believe is the most streamed series ever, statistically speaking, even more than Game of Thrones. Wow. And that, it's a good show. I like it. We watch, I've watched it with uh, Noah, watched a couple with my, my oldest son. You mentioned Aladdin. Did you like the new remake? I did. Yeah. Did you? I did. I, I thought, thought it was really Will, good. I thought Will Smith did a really good job at, as the, at the beginning. I thought, man, he's just trying to be like using the same stuff, and then he kind of had his own, and I I liked it. Yeah, it yeah, it was a really good movie, and I was really pleased with it. And uh, yeah, I think that Disney's crushing it with these live remakes. Although 
the business case of it makes me even more excited because like they're you like a oh, bunch we of already, options. Yeah, we already own and made all of this content and it's clearly very popular. So let's just remake it and launch it again. So it's from a business standpoint, it's really, really smart. Uh, Disney Plus had about 10 million subscribers in the first 24 hours and 15 million over the first week or so, I believe. Um, don't quote me on those numbers, but I think they're pretty directionally sound. That's a lot and fast. Now, that Verizon obviously did their deal where they gave that right. subscription away. So that's probably built into that number. I would assume they did. They don't think they've really split that out, but that's still a lot, that's of, a people. lot of people. It's listening a lot of eyeballs. Yep. Hulu, speaking of Disney, Disney owns. 75%, I think, of Hulu and controls it wholly, so they can do whatever they want with it. The addition of live TV and some original content like The Handmaid's Tale helps subscribers, and now you can bundle Hulu with Disney+, Plus, I think an ESPN+, Plus as well, and kind of get a whole package, like Disney-owned, Disney-branded package, which is pretty cool and could be a good value for some for some people who want to watch all three of those things. Also, there is HBO Max, which is AT&T's new baby. It has new content that they're pushing out, movies and stuff like that. Game of Thrones, I think, should still be on there. It's the same price as the old HBO, which I just recently found stood for home box office. A lot of people probably knew that, but um, I'm a little slow to the game. So HBO equals home box office. Apple TV Plus is next, and they have a few originals, and they've kind of been... It's been tough for them to get the traction coming out of the gate. They have a lot of big names. They have really big budgets. It's not an expensive service, and it's actually free with an Apple purchase device, probably some of the larger ones. But if anyone could buy their way into the streaming game, it would definitely be Apple because they've just got cash on cash on cash. Yeah, but the you know the mindset's got to change from when someone thinks streaming, like you said, Netflix comes to mind because right. they've, they've been doing that for a while. They say, "Oh, I wonder what Apple's doing." You know, to, they got to get that brand recognition in there from their Apple TV to get that. Okay. We have content, not just can you get your shows, but we have our own content. Yeah. And I, there was, you know, there are, there were, were opportunities five years ago, probably before Netflix got to where it is, where Apple could have realistically looked at purchasing Netflix very realistically. Even now I'm sure they have the cash to support some serious thoughts yeah. towards that. And I know that they actually, I think it was when Steve Jobs was still there. They they were in discussion with Disney about a merger. Wow. Now, that was a long time ago, and it never happened. But wow, can you imagine that creative collaboration that that could happen there? I think the big holdup was Snow White. She had a thing with Apple and didn't really want to go (laughs) all in. She had a a bad experience in the past. Once you get burnt by an Apple, it's, it's hard to think about doing things any differently. Also, Sling is one of the first cord cutter options, and it was really limited by area for certain sports packages and channels. That's kind of a downside, but for people looking for kind of a cable alternative to be able to stream, that's definitely is and was kind of a a good option to be able to do that. YouTube's also huge. Premium has original content if you have YouTube Premium, and the ad-supported YouTube is just unbelievably large with content creators from all over the world putting billions of hours of videos on there. And YouTube is the number two search engine in the world, which is followed, or it follows only Google itself, which is its parent company. So Google kind of has the internet cornered in terms of um, search. You need to stop talking. My phone keeps waking up every time you say <laughs> the word Google. So Yeah, this is, this is why I don't have a uh, Android-powered device. Those are some of the big names in there. Let's get a quick survey. Austin, what platforms do you subscribe to? None. I'm turning Amish. All right. So no, actually moving not. on. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've got, uh, I've got quite a few. And one of the things we'll talk about in a little bit is kind of how those things can add up. But I have a Netflix subscription, which I would say you know consumes 95% of my family's streaming, which we love. Even my daughter has the kit. She watches the stuff on the kids' side of things. We also have Amazon Prime Video, which is really just included as part of my Prime subscription. And I don't think I would probably purchase it by itself, but I do like some of the shows on there. And it's kind of handy once in a while just to give you give yourself some variety and an option. And I'm already paying for it, so I might as well use it. I also have YouTube Premium, which I have a free trial of, but I love the ad-free version of YouTube. It is so awesome. I don't think I will subs- or I will continue this subscription afterwards, but wow. Once you go ad-free, it's kind of hard to watch YouTube normally. We also have Disney+, Plus, which we actually have free through Verizon, but we no longer have Verizon, and they haven't kicked us out yet. So if you're listening, Verizon, stop right now. 
And then I've got some motorsports video subscriptions for like Formula One and MotoGP and Super Supercross, um, which you pretty much have to purchase individually to watch the entire seasons. What about you, Josh? Yep. For me, it's kind of like what Austin said. We do have uh, Amazon Prime and Netflix as well. And for my kids, you know, Netflix has some good kid content. There's a little baby bum, mm, which is a little baby um, bum nursery rhymes that are animated, which are addicting for kids and stick in the parents' heads. And so my wife and I found ourselves oftentimes humming nursery rhymes now because it's just relentlessly in your head nonstop. I know there's a rap about peer pressure on that show because my daughter likes that show too. That it once you hear it, you will never succumb to peer pressure it's there. again. Yep. And then we have Disney Plus, uh, which we enjoy. In fact, when I left work this morning, my daughter had just asked to have Tangle turn on, uh, which is the Rapunzel movie. I still haven't seen and that. So yeah, the movie Tangled, it's good. Um, it's got, I think, Mandy Moore is the voice of uh, gotcha. the main character. So it's good. And so they were watching that. And you know, with Disney, they can kind of be searching around on their own. You don't really worry too much about what they're going to find on Disney Plus. True. Uh, and then... Linked in the show notes below is a tear emoji because uh, my main streaming service is discontinued. PlayStation View is what I was using. And at the end of last year, they noted that they were canceling the streaming service, PlayStation by Sony, and they decided to focus back on their gaming platform instead of venturing into the, the streaming. And here we take a break to provide you the dad joke of the week. All right, Austin. What's the difference between a poorly dressed man on a tricycle and a well-dressed man on a bicycle? I don't know this one. You ready? <laughs> I'm, I'm ready, Josh. A tire. <laughs> okay, I had to think about that one. A tire. Yep. A tire. Yep. Like, like one tire? A tire, like one tire, because there's bicycle, tricycle. But then also... A tire, because one's well-dressed, one's not so well-dressed, so it's a T-T-I-R-E, a tire. Is funnier when you explain it oh, so that's the dad joke of the week and we're back with the invested dads yeah so there's two ways to look at subscription services and specifically when it relates to video streaming the first is from the business case side of things and the second is from the consumer case side of things so first and foremost the business case side of things is built around the thought of recurring revenue recurring revenue being Revenue that's recurring every year or every month, kind of in on a cadence, it just comes automatically, and that's kind of how how it's built and how it's generated. And the bull case around streaming services and investing in streaming services is really the potential ability for these companies to raise prices over time. That's really what would help them just continue to grow that top line over time. The reality is that most, if not all, video streaming providers are spending significantly more money making content than they are recouping. Through their, through their fees and their subscription costs. A recent Bloomberg Business Week article, and that was on January 13th, 2020, titled Cable Lost, But Streamers Aren't Celebrating Yet. That article states that Netflix has borrowed $13 billion to create content as the cash it uses from subscriptions exceeds the cash it generates. So in my opinion, and remember, this is not a thing we're talking about in here is... is a recommendation or anything but in my opinion this is one of the things that makes netflix a bit unstable and one of the reasons i'm not necessarily as excited about the company um as an as an as an investment from a fundamental perspective despite the subscriber dominance that really no one can argue with also disney says hulu won't turn a profit till 2023 or later at&t says hbo max won't be profitable until 2024 and other profit, other providers are likely in the red for these services too. And now that's not unusual for new uh, technology or something to come in that you know early into the game it's hard to turn the profit. But the question is, well, now that you're seeing a lot more people buy into this this concept, at what point do they have to turn a profit so that as an investor you're saying, you know what, long term I can see this lasting. It's and kind that's of kind of yeah, where we're landing. It's kind of like the thesis on Lyft and Uber where they're losing massive amounts of money and investors aren't really going to get too excited until they have at least a profitability in sight. Not necessarily that they're there yet, but they have a plan to get to profitability. And for a lot of these, like Josh is saying, 
these companies are getting things going. There's a lot of spending going on. Really, the, the philosophy of you got to pay if you want to play is very much in place here. And it is insane the amount of money that these companies have to go. And it's already it's getting pretty crowded. You know, the, the competition, there's a ton of competition out there. And it's not making it easier to get in. It's actually making it harder. So companies need to spend more. So it's kind of like a catch-22. <laughs> Yeah, and obviously the delay in between coming up with the idea, the production, and then releasing it, trends can switch. You know, the idea of what's popular right now. And so you could spend all this money on a series or a season or a show, and then all of a sudden, well, that's been overdone. No one cares anymore. And then now you're stuck with all this money spent, and it's all on you. Another, yeah, another cool business aspect is that when you're going direct to the consumer with these kind of services, you eliminate the middleman or the distributor in this case for content. Then the control of the content from creation to consumer. And in in theory, you can attain your maximum profits if you do business this way. But the risk is that (laughs) this, this also works the other way. The failure can rest solely on these companies. If things do not go as well as they should, Um, a company can't really go back and blame a distributor. There's going to be a lot of risk there, which is why volatility is probably going to happen. You've already seen this with Netflix over the years, subscriber numbers and stuff like that swings very, swings the stock price very, very sharply. And that's going to go, going to go ahead and continue. Next up, there's the consumer case. So really looking at what is good or bad and how that affects consumers. And that's really the the benefit is that they have the ability now to pick and choose services. They have flexibility. They don't need to be locked into a cable package, which has 500 channels and they're going to use three that they can choose what they want to purchase. So in theory, things can be a little bit less expensive, but do you really save money? I mean, you can, if you have all these cable, all these different services and you're paying for all of them, you may not end up saving money versus a traditional cable package. So if cable's $75 or $100 a month for a total package, if you have, especially if you have one of these live services, but if you have any of the, you know, five or six of these different services, you could be paying more than you had in your cable package anyway. So that is crazy. But the benefit of some of these live streaming options, so like YouTube TV, Hulu Live, Josh's old PlayStation View. Stop bringing it up. (laughs) The benefit is that you're typically not locked into a contract. So if you want to get them for like a sports season or something, that's a very realistic thing to do. So if you're a big football fan, you can have it from September through January or whatever, through through the beginning of February for your Super Bowl, and then you can get rid of it until football starts up again. So that's a that's a flexible option that sometimes you don't have when you have traditional cable, you might be locked into a uh, you might be locked into a contract for a year or two years or whatever that might be. And also with that too with being able to pick and choose, like you said, you know, your cable subscription back in the day was just their choice, you know, here's your package and they say, "Oh, look, there's 270 choices." Yeah, but I don't like those 270 channels. Whereas when you're picking and choosing, you're you're more selective and have that ability. So the the plus side is you may pay a little more, but you're watching more content you care about. So from the consumer side, that's the benefit. Yeah, absolutely. You're controlling it and you're getting what you want. There's a great USA Today article about this very topic about having a bunch of different streaming services and all of that. And we'll throw that link in the show notes. It's a good read. I I would definitely say take a read on that. Also, I just want to know, it. I know, and I've done this myself, it's very, very easy to sign up for free trials of these services and to forget to cancel them when the trial ends. So pro tip, set a calendar reminder for when that free trial ends to go cancel that so you don't get charged. Because if you leave those unchecked and continue to use them and not really worry about it. Those subscriptions you're not even using can really add up and you might not even realize it if you're not looking very closely on your statements. Yep. And also, I know I've done this in the past is if I'm calling to sign up for a free trial and calling, I'll ask it on the phone with them, say, can you please cancel it on this date? And so then I take care of it on that day. Exactly. Do it on one. So some people actually have like a totally separate credit card to keep track of these subscriptions. So they're just like anything they have a subscription for, all their Netflixes and their Disney Pluses or whatever, they would just keep on a separate credit card and they can know exactly what's on there. And if anything funky that they weren't planning on is on there, they it kind of stands out really quickly. So little that is just some be some personal finance tips which may help you kind of plan for that. And you know, speaking of subscriptions, the other one we've kind of touched on but haven't gone too much detail on is sports subscriptions. And so for a big fan of sports, they're now offering more individualized subscriptions to a league, a sport, a team even, um, 
or a race, depending on what, what uh, sport you're looking at. And these can add up quick, but the benefit there is, you know, if you're adamant that I love football, I love the NFL, but you know, my team is over on the West coast and I'm here on the East coast and it's only, I only get to see it on Monday nights, you know, if they play. So maybe twice a year or something, then you look at this and say, okay, I would love to watch my team. Well, it's out there for you and you have to pay for it, but they're giving you the ability. And that's, they found more and more people are fans of, not the local team, but a team either they grew up with or, or whatever drew their, their appeal to. So now there's more demand for not just watching the team that's closest to you, but the team that you care most about. And I would say that the, there's loyalty, like, like you're kind of talking about there, to your team or to your sport. And the companies know that. Oh, yeah. And the companies are able then to pretty much charge whatever they want, knowing that those people yep. are loyal to their team or they're loyal to their sport. And some of those subscriptions can be very, very pricey. I know that... You know, I like watching racing. And when you watch racing, so like Formula One, MotoGP, Supercross, those are three of the ones I subscribe to and watch specifically. I have to get three different subscriptions, and they are not cheap. And But that allows me to watch every single race all year, and I cannot watch it any other way. Yeah, and that's the other thing is, you know, around, me. Yeah, around here, you know, the, F, the F1, the Formula One is more European. I mean, it's the US, some people like it, but it's not as popular. So for you, I mean, there's not really a TV channel to watch that on. So you have to subscribe to it. They've got me locked in and they know that I'll pay whatever the price is. And yeah, so it's, it's there and that's, uh, you know, probably one of the earliest ones when it came to subs, uh, you know, your own subscription was sports, you know, because they had like the, the NFL had their own, you know, the college or what they call that, the, Ticket, or NFL or, Sunday ticket, yeah, Sunday ticket. Yep. Yeah. So you know, those were the ideas of trying it out and saying, "Hey, there are people that'll pay for this," and then that's kind of built from there. So, Josh, who is someone who's particularly excited as a business? Yeah. About yeah. you being a streamer, you know the the people who are just you know licking their lips uh, about this is the internet company, and that's you know for them, they're all they can see is that's more data you're streaming. You know, if you're you're getting rid of your cable and everything's coming through the internet. Guess who controls that bandwidth and that internet? Their internet company is excited to watch that. Now, depending on where you're at and what you subscribe to, some have an unlimited package, but some you have to pay per gig. Mm -hmm. And so they're just watching those numbers roll up as you have to have more and more stream through the internet. And I think that the internet companies are like, wow, we know that streaming takes a lot of data. It takes a lot of speed to be able to run all these devices at one time, which is kind of the way we're at right now. And... They're like, well, people are going to pay up to have no delay, no lag, no load time. So they're making money on people upgrading to faster packages and all that yep. stuff too. So it is a lucrative business. And the plus side for the average consumer too is it also enables them to justify expansion. And so, you know, talk about like fiber optics and the different things. They can now get a wider net of that and then say, we're going to recoup our costs. And so, you know, in the more rural areas where maybe you only have some sort of satellite connection, now they're running that that wires out that direction because they think, you know, in the long run, we're going to make that back up. I hope they do. My my parents live not that far from a town, and uh, the internet situation is pretty pretty remote out there. So maybe all of these streaming services are going to make these other com- these companies kind of force themselves to provide the internet to these people all around the country in rural areas as well. So let's hope. Um, so how can you invest in this trend is kind of a theme that I'd like to discuss a little bit. And I did want to start with saying that listeners should always discuss these types of investments and how they fit into their overall portfolio picture with their advisor and take their advisor's advice on this. This is not advice that we're providing here. But these are just ways that you can get some exposure to streaming and the this growth trend that we're seeing in the market right now. So some of those would be maybe companies where streaming is a part of their business or like an add-on. So those would be companies like Apple where their main business is really selling phones or whatever, but you can get exposure to streaming because they're having a small portion of their business that's being devoted to that. Or Google where search and the internet kind of in total is kind of their main business, but they have YouTube and they have things that you can get exposure to streaming there or AT&T with HBO Max or Amazon with their Prime Video or Disney where they pretty much own all media pretty much that you think about that's Disney controls a ton of that but that is on, the Disney Plus is really only a smaller portion of their business right now it's going to grow with the, the theory with all of these companies but it's not their entire business or you can go to the other side of the coin where streaming is the primary source of revenue for companies like Netflix obviously 
or you can go with companies that provide your internet like Josh just talked about, whether that be AT&T or Verizon. Verizon has home internet. They have mobile internet. Both those companies really do. Charter Communications, which is like Spectrum if you have Spectrum. And like I said, wireless companies with the Disney and Verizon are one ways to do that. Like Josh mentioned earlier, Disney had the the deal to distribute Disney Plus for free, really, for their unlimited Verizon subscribers. So there's definitely ways to invest, and and those are a couple of names that just kind of come to mind in this area. All right. So thanks for listening to us. Uh, if you want to check out our website, we got a free gift for you. It's on there. It's a brief list of eight principles of timeless investing. They're just eight overarching investment themes meant to keep you on track. Our website is that theinvesteddads.com. So check that out. It's free. Yeah, and to help us grow this podcast and continue to help lots of listeners with their finances, we need your help. So we would really like to create some buzz through Apple Podcasts, and one way we can do that is if you would subscribe and listen, so thank you for doing that. Um, But also, if you'd leave us a review, we'd really appreciate it if we helped you out today. And don't forget that if you have any content ideas, any podcast topics that you would like us to discuss in future episodes, you can email those to us at hello at theinvesteddads.com. Yep, in case you missed it, uh, check out our most recent episode where we talked about saving for college. Well, thanks for being here today. We're excited to have you with us and uh, look forward to you listening next time. Talk to you later. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Invested Dads podcast. This episode has ended, but your journey towards a better financial future doesn't have to. Head over to theinvesteddads.com to access all the links and resources mentioned in today's show. If you enjoyed this episode and we had a positive impact on your life, leave us a review. Click subscribe and don't miss the next episode. Josh Robb and Austin Wilson work for Hicks and Zerker Capital Management. All opinions expressed by Josh, Austin, or any podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinions of Hicks and Zerker Capital Management. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon for investment decisions. Clients of Hicks and Zerker Capital Management may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. There is no guarantee that the statements, opinions, or forecasts provided herein will prove to be correct. Past performance may not be indicative of future results. Indices are not available for direct investment. Any investor who attempts to mimic the performance of an index would incur fees and expenses, which would reduce returns. Securities investing involves risk, including the potential for loss of principal. There is no assurance that any investment plan or strategy will be successful.